Hey guys, this is uh, July 7th, 2019, and I'm going to do a little flea market finds, uh, some stuff I picked up of all places. I picked these up at a tag sale while on Memorial Day vacation. That's right, Memorial Day. We were camping Memorial Day weekend. I picked up this stuff. I haven't done anything with the stuff. It's been sitting in the box. There's a couple items in there I want to sell, but I wanted to make sure I got the video out. So I don't even know when this video is going to post because I'm, I'm right now I'm, I've got a ton of editing i got to get through um, to finish up that whole series I've been working on uh, for the big June tool buy, which is uh, all machinist stuff. This is kind of a, uh, a hodgepodge of uh, miscellaneous stuff, so let's dive right in. So like right outside the entrance to the campground we go to down in Connecticut, there's a little ranch house and the guy has got a sign out in front and says tag sale. And we went there on Saturday morning to check out the tag sale, and there was, like, no cars there, nothing, no table set up or anything. And then I saw a little sign, and it basically said you go around back. So this guy's basically working a sale out of his basement of his house. He must be a flea market guy or a clean-out guy or something because the house, the, the basement's just full. He's just got rows of stuff you can walk down and look through. So we're going down there, we're picking through stuff. I see a couple items here and there, but I have no idea what the heck the price is going to be. But then I spot something, and I happen to ask for a price on it. He gives me such a low price that I realize, aha, there's basically stuff here I'm going to buy just because the price is going to be so great. And that's exactly what ended up being the case here. Um, so I think the, I, the icebreaker was... <laughs> I've been back to work on the Tower of Power, and I ended up, I was looking for my muffs for um, these things. You know, um, these, for those of you who don't know, who don't have an outboard motor, these slide onto over the intake, water intake on the lower unit of your outboard. You hook a garden hose up to here, and it allows you to uh, safely run your motor out of the water. Provides the cooling water needed for the impeller to pump the water up to the head and keep it cool. So um, I've got actually a couple of pairs of these already. And of course, the day that I wanted to work on the outboard, I waste, you know, 20 minutes looking everywhere to try and figure out where the heck I last left those. And of the two pair that I, I had, I couldn't find one pair. And I did eventually find a pair. But when I saw these there, I was like, oh, well, all right. These actually, they look... They look like they're in really great shape. I don't even know if they've ever been used. All right, and they are the brand name on them. I recognize right off the bat. I apologize. These are brand name Tempo. I'm not familiar with that brand name. So I have no idea what these cost new. But when he told me he only wanted two bucks for it, I was like, well, yeah, for two bucks, I want a third pair around. <laughs> But the bigger point was, when I knew I was going to get that for two bucks, I knew that this guy basically must get this stuff for free during cleanouts of places. And anything he makes on anything is worth, you know, worth it to him. Handy Tool Works. Two inch by 20 foot ratchet tie down. You can always use extra tie downs. 10561, that's, that's a Harbor Freight uh, part number if I've ever seen one. Um, brand new in the package. I think I got this for three bucks. Box of hand tools there. Dug through the box. Ended up finding a genuine set of vice grip pliers. Okay. Clearly marked vice grip. These are the good old made in the U.S. of A. Um, you know, if they're not completely trashed. Whenever you can buy a pair of genuine vice grip pliers for a couple of bucks like I got this pair, you do it. Uh, a buck. Craftsman. Ratchet. I've got one exactly like this now. Works perfectly fine. Brand new set of these, I think they're nitrile coated um, work gloves. These are multi-purpose gloves. Or Gantz Taut Usage. Latex covered. All right, latex covered gloves. Uh, Blue Hawk brand. 018425. That sure, that sure smacks of the, uh, the old Harbor Freight. Uh, anyways, I think I think he threw these in. I think I probably bundled these with the tools because I knew I, I I know I didn't pay like anything for these really extra. Uh, 
This I actually, I think I paid four bucks for this. And it says Stanley Auger Bits, six bits, one set, 127A. So what caught my eye about this set of auger bits is the fact that I think it's brand new, old stock. I don't think this has ever been used. It's got some uh, rust on one of them here. But kind of a neat set. Because it's new old stock and it's got a clear part number on it, I knew it would be easy to look up the value of this. And like I said, I think I paid four bucks for it. And I could probably let this go for, I don't know, like 10 bucks and everybody would be happy. Old eBay, when you need a price value on something. Of course, this isn't definitive because there's only one that's sold in the past 90 days. But there it is. It's a Vintage Stanley 127A drill bit set in roll. Uh, it sold for 24 bucks with free shipping, but that's clearly a used set. It doesn't have the original cardboard box. Got this for 50 cents. Um, not long before we left for that trip. The missus comes to me and says, hey, the outlet in the bathroom's not working. So I go and I check, and it's not tripped. And sure enough, it's dead. Uh, the GFI circuit inside the outlet had gone bad. So um, I ended up having uh, an extra GFI outlet on hand and uh, changed it out. And uh, when I saw this, uh, with a bunch of other new old stock uh, electrical items in a box, I was like, I checked and verified, and yeah, no, it's brand new. Never been used. Uh, so I think I get this for 50 cents or a buck. Figured, hey, why not? Leviton's a good brand. At least I believe it's a good brand. I hope it is because I got a lot of Leviton in my house. Paid a buck for this little guy right here. Right? A General Electric weld gauge catalog number 92X512. Arc Welders, Electrodes, and Accessories, a product of the welding department, Fitchburg, Massachusetts. So that caught my eye. And what we have in here is a little a doohickey in my job. So this is a GE Catalog 92X512 weld gauge made in the USA. So it's basically it's a radius gauge. See, over here it's showing us radius gauges, right? Radius, radii. And it fans out like this so you can get to both sides. So I thought that was pretty cool. A little bit of... This looks like it's brass, actually. Discolorated. With this nice little cool pouch with the little happy little cartoon welder on the back there. Well, it's a good thing I only paid a couple bucks for that thing, or a buck or two, because uh, two on eBay right now. One for twenty-five bucks with free shipping, and one with twenty, one for twenty bucks with free shipping, and I couldn't find any that had sold. So not a lot of interest in that thing. This is one of the first items I spotted in a box, and it was, this was before I knew how cheap things were going to be. So I actually had looked at this, pondered, you know, whether or not I want to bother making an offer on it, and then put it back. But then when I got such a good deal on the uh, on the muffs for the outboard motor, I decided to uh, go back pull this out. So, anyways, uh, this name caught my eye, Boss. For those of you who don't know. Uh, Boss is a large manufacturer of um, electronics for musicians. Uh, specifically, they make a lot of guitar pedals and effects pedals. <coughs> Excuse me. Different pedals for uh, guitar sound effects. Uh, this is a Dr. Rhythm DR110 graphic. This is a uh, miniature drum machine. So uh, this would be something you would use if you wanted to... Um, like uh, create a, uh, a backing rhythm so you could play along to. Um, you know, not uh, probably not going to be the kind of quality that you're going to get from a lot of more expensive machines. I don't remember how much this is worth. Um, I ended up getting this for <coughs> five bucks as is. 
I didn't even have to show him that the issue was my main concern with it was notice how clean these contacts are and how horrendously corroded those contacts are so batteries were left in here allowed to leak and that could be an issue I don't know if this works at all so let's find out together so we'll start by uh, we'll clean that we'll clean those contacts real quick all right not the uh, not the greatest job but enough to just do a preliminary check because you know if the thing is junk there isn't much point in getting overzealous with cleaning the battery contacts let's see the start is I gotta figure out how to turn this thing on okay so it is on and nothing is lighting up over here, so that does not bode well. Ah, so what you viewers at home may have been able to clearly see when I was showing that close-up of the battery contacts. Uh, did I show a close-up after I cleaned them? Clean them? Well, um, anyways, I had uh, not done a very good job. There was a contact area was really bad so I looked at it under magnification scraped that area clean and voila we now have life okay so you have to view this at a very specific angle that's actually working out pretty good right now but uh, right now so you know it's pretty intuitive here uh, you got uh, 1 through 16 on the top is going to be, I guess, the beats. So um, so right now, for instance, it's showing symbol hi-hat is on every beat, except for the eighth. Um, so we got hi-hat, oh hi-hat, snare drum, bass drum, yada, yada, yada. So, I think um, you could probably do a manual mode where you just hit these to make the sound. There's a hand clap, a cymbal, a cymbal hi-hat, uh, an O hi-hat, I don't know what that is, snare drum, bass drum, and I don't know what accent does. I don't know what most of this stuff does, but who cares? But if I hit start, it actually probably... might be playing right now I don't know so the only other thing I really get to do to verify whether or not this thing's working because I don't have an instruction book is if I um, hook an amplifier up to it and see whether or not I get any sound out of it all right this is my uh, boxer 30 bass guitar amplifier uh, this is actually made in Great Britain this is Maybe by a company called Trace Elliott. It's kind of a neat amplifier. Uh, I'm just going to use it for this drum machine. Okay.
Hmm, pretty cool. Hey, that's a good sign. Here's somebody selling a DR110 on eBay right now, and they've got an opening bid of 50 bucks, and they're looking for 10 bucks shipping. Wow, are you kidding me? Boss DR110, Dr. Rhythm graphic drum machine with tracking. $142.99. It's funny, it says shipping from Japan. So I wonder why that one's so crazy expensive. Oh, here's one. Australia. That's weird. Why is this a, uh, why is this coming up as a foreign, mostly foreign auctions? Shipping from Japan. That's weird. Well, anyways, I, I know I'll make a little money on this if I ever get around to selling it. Might have to keep it, though. It's kind of fun. <laughs> also, at this sale, I picked up these two, uh, these two old wood planes, and, uh, Normally, I don't really bother with woodworking tools, but being able to buy something as uh, at such a good deal, I figured I'd take a chance on these. This is a uh, it says Bailey number four on the front here, and then it says Stanley there. So I don't know enough about wood planes. I don't know why there's two names on that one. And this one also says Bailey over here. This one doesn't say Stanley on this part. Uh, this is it's a number five on the back here. So, and then this there's, there's some kind of writing or something on the inside here. I can't quite make it out. So, you know, they would need a little bit of work. I'm not a plain person, so I'll just look up the value roughly and price them accordingly. Oh, so I just did a quick search on these planes. So the uh, both of these planes are fairly common, I guess. Uh, this number five, you know, it's got the damage here on the top of the, uh, the handle. Um, you know, I figured even in the condition it's in, it should be worth about 15 bucks. The, uh, you know, the thing of it is, if, if you're going to take less than 15 for it, you might as well part it out. A lot of these parts are, are uh, usable. And, you know, I see, like, people getting 10 bucks for this assembly right here, this whatever you call this. It shows you I'm not a plane person, so I'm not a wood plane collector or anything like that. But I can see that there's several components here that could be removed and reused like this isn't broken you know uh, this one is in much better shape this uh, this number four um, this one I figure is worth uh, it's got just you can see where this clearly was sitting on its side somewhere where it got where it was wet but that should clean up fairly easily the bottom surface is in good shape you know that's where the rubber hits the road so to speak that appears to be in pretty decent shape so um, these handles aren't broken, so I figure that one, I figure, um, I'll offer the pair for 40. And I spotted this, uh, the wall, and I was like, well, you know, <laughs> how much is this going to be worth? Because, sure, you got the charger, the original DeWalt charger, but the only tool he had was this impact driver, um... And that battery's dead now, but I was able to successfully charge this battery. This battery refuses to take a charge at all, so this battery is skunked. So I'm going to drop this off at my local uh, Home Depot. They, uh, they take these in for recycling. At least last time I checked, they did. It's actually a Recycle Me sticker on here, 1-800-8-BATTERY. 
There used to be quite a few companies like that. I don't know if they're still around that had a program where you could call them and they would send you a free shipping carton to put the battery in and mail it back to them so you didn't have to pay postage to recycle, which was a good idea. Um, but like I said, Home Depot was taking those. I was disheartened to find out that Home Depot did stop accepting fluorescent uh, lights for recycling. I used to be able to bring my fluorescent lights there. I changed over all of my shop lights to LED now. Um, well, actually, probably 90% of them have been changed out. So I had to get rid of a bunch of fluorescent tubes and had to pay a disposal fee because, well, the alternative is improperly dispose of them. The problem is a lot of those um, fluorescent tubes, they contain mercury. And once they're broken, if they go to a landfill and they're, they, they end up obviously becoming smashed. Uh, that mercury can get into the ground water and cause all kinds of problems. Mercury is one of those metals. It's a metal. And it's one of those metals that it takes a very small amount in our food or in our food chain or water chain, for lack of a better term. Uh, doesn't take a lot of mercury in your body to cause some real serious problems. Um, especially dangerous for um, pregnant women. Causes some really horrid birth defects or it can. So enough about that. Just basically saying try whenever possible to recycle responsibly. So anyways, the uh, guy said five bucks. So I was like, you know what? For five bucks, I'm going to take a chance because worst case scenario is if both the batteries were junk, because I wasn't able to test it right there, if both the batteries were junk, then I would just recycle the batteries, um, maybe try and sell this online, and I know I could get at least five bucks for this charger. So anyways, so I got a little impact driver for five bucks. I could just use that here in the shop. Unfortunately, like I said, only one battery, but eh, whatever. I also got this only for a few bucks. I think uh, this might have been five bucks for this thing. Because, um, you know, he probably felt that it had some sort of antique value to it. Um, I was just intrigued by it. I've never seen one. It's got this nice T handle to it. Landers, Frary, and Clark. And fr I'm saying Frary because it's F-R-A-R-Y. So... Landers, Frary, uh, <laughs> and Clark, New Britain, Connecticut, USA. Oh, it actually says what it is right on the back side. <laughs> it says Columbia Meat Juice Press. And it's a number two. So they must have had different sizes. So this, yeah, this is just standard Columbia meat juice press. Um, those of you who uh, follow my channel know I'm a big uh, pro meat juice guy. You know, uh, got to get them uh, lipids and all that stuff out of the meat. And, uh, you know, lots of times they say you're not getting enough uh, vitamins and stuff out of your meat. Well, it's because you're not squeezing that vitamin out of there. All right. I'm just being silly. Okay. So, the things you learn. <laughs> All right, back in the 1800s, apparently, uh, it was a common practice to extract juice from meat and use it to feed people who were ill or uh, unable to feed themselves because the idea was that you were able to get a lot of the uh, nourishment out of the meat in a uh, liquid form so if they were too ill to be able to chew and swallow, for instance, uh, you could make a, uh, not really a soup, but you would, you would use that juice and feed them the juice to try and get some protein into them, I guess, an iron or whatever. And uh, so apparently many of, many an affluent household back in the 1800s would have one of these. It is missing um, a couple of things. It's missing a small uh, cup that would fit underneath here and it's missing the top part of the press which is uh, appeared to be a cast piece of metal with a hole in it that this would uh, push into and it had a almost a star-shaped um, 
uh, gussets or um, or ribs to strengthen it so that you could really <coughs> squeeze down on that juice <laughs> so um, <coughs> Prices vary all over the place on this thing. Uh, this one, missing the uh, the other components, probably doesn't have much value at all. Uh, I just thought it was kind of a neat thing. I guess, if nothing else, um, I can use it as a very small arbor press. <laughs> I mean, it probably would work really well. I bet you it actually has some decent crushing power. And again, in the same vein of, you know, normally I wouldn't bother purchasing something like this, but because the price was so darn cheap. This is a, uh, it's one of these laser light deals here where you, um, I'm going to have to find a sharp stick or peg to stick this on. You put this out in front of your house in the winter time and you tilt it and you aim it up and it's got a little I think a color wheel in there that turns around some colored LEDs it's got a uh, couple of buttons here color mode and rotate mode it's made in China like most of these things but it gives you a little uh, a little light show so it's kind of neat it's the latest rage now with these uh... so I actually tested this to make sure it works so this one makes uh snowflakes and uh, red dots of course green and red your traditional Christmas colors green snowflakes or or just red dots rotate mode you can have it still or you can have it rotate my wife and I noticed that now people are taking these camping and they set them up and shine them on their trailers at night it's kind of neat Anyways, uh, you know, my wife bought one of these, I don't know, some cheapo junk store, you know, and uh, it didn't work very long and then it just quit working. Power supply or something crapped out in it. So I figured, well, this would be a replacement for that. And I think this one's actually a little bit better because I, I think the one she had only had two openings here. So I think it only, I think that one didn't have the snowflake deal. I think it just had colored lights. Anyways, I got that like for a buck or two, and I plugged it in to make sure that it was working before I even bothered plunking down the two bucks on it. So uh, I had my junior picker with me, my youngest son, Mark, and um, he got the, uh, the deal of the day, I think, actually, and that was this item right here. So I spotted this little case, and I was like, oh, this looks like speakers. So I, I, this must be some silly thing that, like, I don't know, hold uh Maybe it holds MP3 player or whatever. So I, I open it up, and lo and behold, it's a very cheesy-looking plastic record player called the Dodo Cool. So I, uh, I call my son over and I say, "Hey, Mark, look at this. This is kind of neat. It's a little portable record player." And he decides that you know he would like it. So he's gonna work on his his bargaining skills though, because he asked me. He says, "Well, how much do you think I should pay for that?" And I said, well, I said, I don't even know if it works, but I'd take a chance on it for, for, you know, anywhere up to five bucks. I said, up to five bucks. So I said, well, go over and ask. So he goes over with the record player. And he says to the guy, he says, would you take five dollars for this? <laughs> and luckily the guy said, yeah. So he got it for the five. But I told him afterwards, I said, hey, Mark. I said, uh, you're, you're aiming for five, but he might counter. So, so the other thing is, he was saying everything was, you know, he was giving us, he was giving us the prices so cheap. Could have just said, hey, uh, how much for the record player? And if he said three bucks, you'd leave there two dollars richer. That was the little lesson I taught him. So when we got it back to the, um, uh, got it back to the camper, and plugged it in. And checked it out. First thing I noticed when I turned it on was that um, it didn't rotate. So I was like, ah, okay. But turns out there's a little C clip here. I popped this C clip off, lifted this up, and the belt, which it uses a very thin little belt. Turntables typically use, like regular turntables, use a, a flat belt unless they're direct drive. Of course, direct drive means that the motor 
uh, this is actually the spindle on the motor. On, on belt drive turntables, they use a flat belt almost always. This uses what they call a square cut belt and a very small one. It's almost like a large elastic band. So um, let me just plug this thing in for you. So I ended up seeing the belt was off, but I noticed that the motor was running when I would turn it on. So put the belt back on and we were right back in business. All right, so just a quick on a look on the outside. There is a, uh, a line output. So you could hook this up to a stereo, a regular stereo receiver like a regular phonograph, although I don't think you need to use a phono input. Since it's line out, this would have line level um, voltage coming out of it, which is in millivolts. And phonographs, because they have no amplification stage in them, it's just the, uh, the magnetic or ceramic cartridge is outputting a much lower voltage believe it's in microvolts or it's just a lot smaller in uh, millivolts. The point is if you take a um, phonograph, regular phonograph, and you try and plug it into a line input like an auxiliary in or a tape in or a CD in on a receiver, it's not going to work. If you take a CD player and you inadvertently plug it into a phono input on a receiver, you're going to have a problem. It's going to be overdriving. It's going to be very distorted, and you can actually even damage the first uh, stage of amplification in there. So that's just a quick little tutorial on that. But anyway, so we got a jack on the back here for uh, this power plug. This also can be run on batteries, so it can be completely portable. Uh, there is also a auxiliary input, so you could take for instance your phone or an mp3 player and plug it into here and use the amplifier in here that's driving these little speakers there's a little um, lock right here to lock the arm so that it's not bouncing around this is an on and volume knob so turn it on and it gives me a little boop 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 three beep thing so there's a lot more going on here than just your simple you know uh, cartridge needle cartridge into a preamp into an amp to the speakers there's some sort of electronic wizardry going on inside here there's also buttons over here mode slash record skip forward um, delete yada 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 so on the side here on the side here we have a USB port we also have a mini SD card slot. And what Mark and I were able to figure out by going online and looking this up, we were able to find out this darn thing can actually allow you to record onto an SD card from an LP. So if you've got old LPs and you want to ch change them into... I'm hoping it changes them into MP3s. I didn't read up on it and everything. You can actually convert them to MP3 files, and then you could play them on any of your personal devices, phone or whatever. So, uh, power it up. As soon as I... There you go. See? Okay. So, let's get an LP or an album or a record. Those were all probably strange words, but... Boys and girls, gather around. Uncle Stevie will tell you all about LPs and albums. Now, this is from, let's see. Over 25 years ago, I was given this LP, along with a bunch of other, other LPs, and it was used when I got it. Okay, so it didn't look actually much worse than this when I got it. And the vinyl was already well worn, but... This is Led Zepp. I forgot what album this is, but this is one of the... This is I think this is Physical Graffiti. And this is a two-record set. Now, back in my day, you actually sat and listened to music. And you didn't always have it just playing in the background and doing stuff, other stuff. Sometimes you would just sit there and listen to the music. I mean, really get into the music. 
I dig music. And another part of the experience was the album covers. So you had a lot of different album cover art out there. And that is why today there are people who collect album covers just so they can frame them and hang them on the wall as art. So this is an interesting album cover because it's basically it's an apartment building, but all the windows are cut out, see? Okay. And what they did was they put a bunch of pictures in here random photos of different stuff and you could uh, you could change them you could flip it around right okay so I was looking on here there's there's <clears throat> it's probably from the first moonwalk that's probably Neil Armstrong right I don't know it's an old movie there some old um, movie star actress by the looks of it members of the band that, that's got to be Bonzo himself there. I think Bonzo was his nickname, right? John Bonham. I bet you that's him right there. If you enjoy reading about uh, early rock bands, you should uh, check out Hammer of the Gods, which is a, uh, a story about Led Zepp. Even the label has art on it. Yes, this is Physical Graffiti, side one. 1975. Some long songs back then. There's only three songs on this side. Forgive me if this, you know, I hope this doesn't inflame the copyright police. Alright, so obviously we're not going to get any bass response out of this thing because of the little tiny speakers, but you get the idea. Um... Don't want to play too much of that because, again, the copyright Nazis are going to be all over us. Of course, that's Jimmy Page. Three songs on this side. Houses of the Holy. Trampled underfoot. Cashmere. So my son hasn't really had a chance to use this thing because he didn't have any records. So I told him I would give him some records. What better indoctrination to great rock and roll than Led Zepp? I'm being entirely honest, this was never one of my really favorite albums of theirs. There's, there's some hits and misses on here for sure. I think I always felt that with this particular album, it didn't need to be a double album. They could have weeded out some stuff and probably, although a couple of these songs on here are really long, so. Oh yeah, Down by the Seaside is on this. First, let's hear that Brian Noir stomp. wife's watering her garden, so that noise you hear is the spigot being turned. Yes, 
So I've got like every, almost every Led Zepp album. I have every Led Zepp album that was commercially produced. And I have now, I think, gotten almost every one of those on CD. So if I want to hear them scratch free, although the fidelity is different, you know, there's definitely a difference. There are some purists who really love vinyl because of the fidelity. Um, the, the, the argument, I'm not going to get into the argument, but there is absolutely a difference. And you actually have, if you want to quote, say, higher fidelity with a CD because a CD has a much wider um, frequency range capability than the vinyl record does. But a lot of people feel that that something is lost by the fact that that that's happening, you know, um, that, 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 that takes away something from it. I don't know. You know, when I was growing up in school, they taught us that, uh, the human ear, the audible range of frequencies is from 20 Hertz to 20,000 Hertz. And I know personally, and I defy any, anybody else try and actually hear something in that complete range. Down to 20 hertz is incredibly low frequency. You would feel it probably before you would hear it. And 20,000 hertz, that's really up there. I think my experience was somewhere around 17,000 maybe. I don't, I don't recall anymore. But if you ever get a hearing test done, um, ask the technician if she could tell you what frequency you topped out at. You'd be surprised at how far below 20,000 hertz you probably will be, unless, you know, hey, maybe you're a hamster or something. All right, so I think I've uh, beaten this to death. Probably made this episode run long. I apologize. So I hope you guys are continuing to enjoy these videos that I am taking the time to put out there. And if you're not a subscriber, I would ask you, please consider subscribing because you never know what I'm going to get into next. I am on the verge. I am less than 500 subs away from my 10,000th subscriber. And that may not mean much to many of you, but I think it's kind of neat. I think back in the day, in the early days of YouTube... When you reach 10,000 subs, it was a mile marker that they commemorated in some way. Now it's just gotten to the point now where it's like, uh, no. Nah. I think you, I don't even know. It would be interesting to see what happens when I hit 10,000. I am going to have to do something for my 10,000th, though, right? I'm going to have to do something when I hit 10,000 subs. I got to, I don't know. I haven't decided yet. I don't know if I'm, maybe I'll do a giveaway. Maybe I'll do some kind of a raffle of something. But that's kind of tough because, you know, my first thought was, well, I could I could raffle off an indicator, say, a machinist indicator, right? But there's a lot of people who watch my channel who they come to the channel for different things and they probably might not enjoy that. You know, I don't know. Well, I have to think of something or maybe not give something away. You know, maybe we don't have a big enough pool to draw from to, to do something like that at 10,000 subs. Maybe the idea would be... Um, Let's see. I don't know. Maybe we could set something on fire or blow something up. <laughs> All right, guys. Thanks for watching. Oh, bonus footage. If you're still tuned in, just in case you were curious, I have my record collection at another location. I haven't gone through it and brought it here and decided to catalog it or anything like that yet. I have a lot of albums that are still in really good shape. I mentioned that I have all the Led Zepp. I also have some rare import LPs, Led Zepp and others, uh, that yeah, I can't find on CD. But in case you were just curious, I just happen to have this small stack. If you wanted to get a glimpse into my younger years, my musical tastes, I was always into, I always wanted to play guitar like a madman and never ever acquired the chops to do it. So this is a uh, instrumental album by uh, Steve Morse. He put out um, some fantastic guitar playing. He appears to be playing a Ernie Ball Music Man, judging from what he's holding there in his hands. I always enjoyed comedy. This is the comedy of Stephen Wright. He's uh, kind of a satirist, I guess would be maybe 
a good explanation for his type of comedy. He uses a lot of double entendres, I think is the term. This album was given to me used and well-worn when I got it, and I absolutely fell in love with it, because again, being a guitar uh, lover, lover of good guitar playing, this is Jeff Beck, Wired. This is an instrumental. Um, interestingly enough, on the cover here, Jeff's uh, wielding what certainly appears to be a Stratocaster with a whammy bar, which in his later years he came to um, master... Uh, he uses the whammy the way that a lot of guys use a pick. Um, but anyways, check out the back. What's he sporting there? Gibson Les Paul. Pretty cool. So, that's probably something more like what he might have uh, played in his younger years when he was with like the Yardbirds or one of those guys. I don't know. Although when he was in the Yardbirds, he probably couldn't even afford it. Pink Floyd, Wish You Were Here. Great album. Great album. Dark Side of the Moon was a bigger seller than this, but Wish You Were Here is a great album. Uh, Have a Cigar, Wish You Were Here, Shine On You, Cr Shine on you Crazy Diamond. Um, and then it just goes on as multiple parts of that. Welcome to the Machine. I always thought Welcome to the Machine was on a different album, but nope, it's on there. And then, of course, being a big... Pink Floyd fan, I bought a lot of other stuff and ended up buying this album. This album is called Animals. And this is not a commercially uh, very successful album like their other stuff. Uh, this has a lot of that kind of stuff where you just kind of, uh, you know, you sit and listen to it type of music here. Pigs on the Wing. Has a very small little acoustic ditty, uh, small song, but then it goes into a very long song that takes up the rest of side one called Dogs, that actually features dogs barking. A bit of trivia for you: there's actually old show WKRP in Cincinnati. There's a great scene where Doctor Johnny Fever is kicking back and he's got his sunglasses on in the DJ booth. So Mr. Carlson, the boss, comes in and sees him just sitting there and can't tell if he's asleep or not. Puts his hand in front of him, you know, and does the old, hey, are you, uh, can you see? And Johnny ignores him, but then you can, they, they give a close-up of Johnny's eyes behind the glasses, and you can see that he's clearly, clearly watching what Mr. Carlson's doing. Mr. Carlson is listening to what Johnny's listening to, which is dogs. It gets to the part where the dogs are barking. So then he goes over to the turntable and he's trying to read the label on the uh, record there and he's about to touch it to stop it so he can read it. Of course, they're on the air. So as soon as he moves for it, Johnny says, don't touch that. And then he says, oh, he says, uh, hey, it, do, do I hear dogs barking on this album, on this song? And Johnny just says, I do. <laughs> as if to imply that Maybe not everybody hears it. <laughs> uh, was that was that story as lame as I thought? I don't know. Boop 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 boop. I'm on drugs. <laughs> 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 <laughs>